Reading through the Bible in one year, February 18th, Exodus chapter 1, Luke chapter 4, Job 18, and 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And as we're in a new book, let's read the introduction. Eventually. There we go. Button clicky. Hard. <clears throat> Exodus tells of God fulfilling his promise to Abraham by multiplying Abraham's descendants into a great nation, delivering them from slavery in Egypt, leading them to the promised land, and then binding them to himself with a covenant at Mount Sinai. Moses, under the direct command of God and as leader of Israel, received the Ten Commandments from God, along with other laws uh, governing Israel's life and worship. He also led the nation in the building of the tabernacle, a place where God's presence dwelled among his people and where they made sacrifices for sin. Traditionally, Jews and Christians recognize Moses as the author, writing sometime after the exodus from Egypt. Let's begin. Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came, each one with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were seventy in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful, and increased, and multiplied, and became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. And a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it be, sorry, yeah, and it be in the event of war, that they also join themselves to those who hate us, and fight against us, and go up uh, from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labors. And they built for Pharaoh storage cities, uh, Pithom and Ramesses. But uh, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out, so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. So the Egyptians brutally compelled the sons of Israel to slave labor. And they made their lives bitter with hard slave labor and mortar and bricks and in all kinds of slave labor in the field, all their slave labor which they brutally compelled them to do. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other was named Pua. And he said, When you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not do as the king of Egypt had spoken to them, but let the boys live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? Well, then the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can come to them. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. Now it happened that because the midwives feared God, he made households for them. And Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. Bringing up the rest of the notes here for you. And nearly there. I'm just going to pull from this side and pull them up. And there you go. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to Luke chapter 4. Now, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was being led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. When they had finished, he was hungry. In the Greek. Duh. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, a neat note on this text, um, the term 
if can also be translated as since, as in since you are. So you can read it either way. I mean, obviously the devil knows who Jesus is. But if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Well, Jesus answered him, note quoting from scripture. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms, uh, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this dominion and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, You shall uh, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Again, quoting scripture. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, quoting scripture. And when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout all the surrounding districts. And he was teaching in their synagogues and being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the uh, release to the captives and recovery of the sight, or rather recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Now it's not, not like he was just doing a normal reading and sat down. Everybody's like, ooh, whoa, what's he going to say? Um, in this time, when uh, the, the pastor, essentially, was, was giving the sermon, he would read from the text, and then he would sit down to teach. Not like today, where the pastor stands up in front of the congregation and stays standing the whole time. It's a long time to stand. Back to verse 21. And Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, the the note that says that he began to say to them means that with this statement, he um, began his statement, and then he had more to say after this, but this is all that we have down in the text. And all were speaking well of him and marveling at the gracious words which are coming forth from his lips. And they were saying, "Is, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard took place at Capernaum, do also here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the whole land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. Again, a Gentile. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian, again another Gentile. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. There's more text there, but I can't get to it yet, because there's such a huge block of text here um, about this section that I'm still slowly scrolling through. It's a really big section. Strongly recommend you read it. It's really, really good. Kind of gives a great preface for the rest of the text we're going to go through. Again, you can pause and just read through these at any time. All right, so back to verse 28. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. 
And they stood up and drove him out of the city and led him to the edge of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But Jesus, passing through their midst, went on, their, uh, sorry, went on his way. We learn a lot of things about Jesus in this one section. First, Jesus had the ability to blend into the crowd such that he could disappear among them. This is a cool thing that we see happen later. But also, we learn something about the Jews. Why is it that they wanted to kill him? That they wanted to throw him off the cliff? Because he had said that um, salvation came to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. Again, that's what John the Baptist was telling people, warning them that they needed to go through the same purification that Gentiles went through when they became Jews. He was baptizing them in the same way for forgiveness of sins, leading them back to the truth of Scripture. And yet, here, what do we also see? We see the same type of thing where Jesus is telling them that they need to keep um, fruit in bearing with repentance. Because God sent a salvation to the Gentiles instead of the Jews, even though the Jews had need. He sent salvation to the Gentiles because the people were in rebellion. Verse 31. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man uh, possessed by uh, the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Leave us alone! What do we have to do with you, Jesus the Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked it, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, it came out of him without doing him any harm. An amazement came upon them all, and they were all talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him was spreading into every place in the surrounding district. Then he stood up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering uh, from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she stood up and began waiting on them. And while the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. And the demons were also coming out of many, shouting and saying, You are the Son of God, but rebuking them. He was not allowing them to speak, because they knew him to be the Christ. Again, this is a messianic title. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were eagerly seeking for him. And came to him, and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Bringing up the rest of the notes here for you. There we go. Let's move on to Job 18. Job's other friend now speaks. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, How long until you put an end to your words? Show understanding and then we can talk. Why are we regarded as beasts and as dense in your eyes? O you who tear yourself in anger. For your sake is the earth to be forsaken or, or, or the rock to be removed from its place. Indeed, the light of the wicked goes out, and the flame of his fire gives no light. The light in his tent is darkened, and his lamp goes out uh, above him. His vigorous stride is shortened, and his own counsel brings him down. For he is thrown into the net by his own feet, and he steps on the netting. A snare seizes him by the heel, and a device snaps shut on him. A rope for him is hidden in the ground. 
and a trap for him in the path. All around, terrors frighten him and harass him at every step. His vigor is famished, and disaster is at his ev- sorry is at his side. Starting over, and disaster is ready at his side. The firstborn of death eats parts of his skin. It eats parts of him. He is torn from the security of his tent, and they march him and step before the king of terrors. There dwells in his tent nothing of his. Brimstone is scattered on his abode. His roots are dried below, and his branches cut off above. Memory of him perishes from the earth, and he has no name abroad. He is driven from light into darkness, and he chased rather in chase from the inhabited world. He has neither offspring nor posterity among his people, nor any survivor where he sojourned. Those in the west are appalled at his fate, and those in the east are seized with horror. Surely is the rather surely such are the dwellings of the unjust, and this is the place of him who does not know God. Once again, they're, they're just recounting to him that, well, we know that bad things only happen to bad people. Therefore, you must be a bad person. That's the implication. Job responds tomorrow. Let's move on now to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul continues this letter of correction. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and sexual immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. Now, this doesn't mean it's his mom. It probably means that his um, father either had two wives or perhaps um, was divorced and uh, had another wife, but We don't really need to explain too much more of this to know why it's wrong. But apparently this church, uh, this church in Corinth, embracing their Christian liberty, was embracing this person who wasn't releasing their sin. They knew it to be wrong, but they were celebrating him within the church. Verse 2, and you have become puffed up and have not mourned instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him uh, who has so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus... Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Okay, so what, what, what's this about with the destruction of the flesh and casting him out? Um, this is essentially just church discipline. We'll go over it, well, we've already gone over it a little bit when we went through Matthew 18, but the way that it works is when somebody within your church um, refuses to repent of some sort of uh, wicked sin that's evident to other people. You go to them first and you mention that, look, I, I, I could be wrong personally, but I've noticed this thing is happening. Can you please explain it to me? And then when it's found out to be sin and they're unrepentant of it, then you go and you get an elder to come with you. So there's a witness. And both of you confront this person over this sin. If that still doesn't work, then you bring it to the church. Let the church decide what's going to happen. And then if you decide with the church that they should be excommunicated, it doesn't mean like it does in the Catholic Church that somebody is officially cut off from God forever and they're banished to hell because the church said so. No. What it means is that you're recognizing that this person is unwilling to repent of their sin. This is a mark of a Christian 
We should always first be like the apostles. When Jesus said, one of you will betray me, all of the apostles looked at themselves and they said, not me. I'm not going to do it, am I? Because they understand the sin within them. In the same way that we as Christians should be tender to the, the, the sin of our brothers and sisters in the church, but we should also be tender to our own hearts, recognizing that we are our own worst enemies. Our desire is always for self-worship and self-glorification. It's who we are. It's what we are. So these are the things that we always need to be careful to do. So when someone comes to you in the church and says, I'm recognizing these things in you, or I'm seeing these things, and I, I think it may be me who is wrong, but can we discuss it? Discuss it with them with an open heart. You could be in the wrong, or maybe it's just a misunderstanding. But regardless, what, what a Christian does is they look at these things and they go, yeah, okay, so maybe I do need to work on this. Can you help me with it, or do you know someone who can help me work on these things? That's the response of a Christian. A non-Christian doesn't care about these things. They love their sin. And when it's called out against them, they don't repent. They lash out in anger. So this is the kind of thing that happens. Right? This is how we're supposed to handle sin within the church. And if that person is unrepentant, even to the church, to the entire community, that they've um, become a member of that church, that's part of the, the role of the church in your life. They are there to judge you based on your confession that you are a Christian. And if you are unwilling to live as a Christian, then they have to remove you from the church. They set you outside and say that you're no longer welcome here. And then if you go to another church and try to become a member and they find out that you were a member of this church and that pastor reaches out to your pastor, they're going to talk about this and they're going to say, your previous pastor will say, yeah, he was excommunicated for this reason. So maybe you should talk to him about why he didn't tell you he went here first. These things happen. But the main point of all of this is that there's always an eye toward redemption. There's always an eye toward re uh, reconciliation. God has done this with me more times than I can count, where I think that I've defeated some sin in my life. And so once I get prideful about it and puffed up, he allows me to fall into that again, and I have to claw my way back out repenting the whole time, understanding that, that I'm struggling with sin and I will continue to struggle with sin until the day I die. But praise be to God, nothing has happened such that I've been uh, kicked out of a church. So what we see here is just a church doing its job, taking care of those within the church, right? Right? pointing out sin as it's sin, and they should be a good church and set this person outside. Now, for the line about the destruction of the flesh, it's not like you know he's expecting Satan to go at him with whips and rip the skin off his body. So that is kind of how it reads if you just read it in the text. What he literally means is... We as Christians exist as functionally two different people, right? And, and as we read through in, in Romans chapter 7, we read about Paul's inner battle between his flesh, right? That being his mortal, natural body with its natural desires for self-gratification, self-worship, all of those things. And then his spirit spiritual self, which is um, who he is in Christ. This is his converted self that still exists within a body of death, a body that longs after sin, that habitually will try to chase after certain things that, that will gratify its own desires. So when we see this here, this is what we're looking at. 
when he says that uh, you need to deliver such a one to Satan, let him go back to his father for the destruction of his flesh. If he's so engra- sorry, so, so engrossed in this sin, if he's a true Christian, release him. Let him reach rock bottom. And when he reaches rock bottom, then God's going to do his work to bring him back to you. And that's where the, the eye toward reconciliation exists. But in the meantime, get this person out of the church. Because you're making us look like fools among the Gentiles. Because you're embracing sin that even they can't stand. This is why it concludes with, um, so that his spirit, his converted self, if he's a true Christian, may be saved in the day of the Lord. Verse 6, your boasting, again, they're boasting about his sin, is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, was was also sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Strongly recommend you read the notes on this. They're fantastic. It it, it talks about the, um, what's it called? Um, there's the, the Passover where you're supposed to have no leaven in your house, uh, or, or you're not supposed to eat any leaven. Um, they had this thing where they would scour their house looking for any yeast that might be there so that it could, wouldn't even be found in their home. So they wouldn't accidentally have some yeast in with their unleavened bread. Right. Again, this is following the letter of the law to the letter of the law, right? To the, to the nth degree. But this is something that Jews in this time would understand. And so that's why he says that you need to cleanse out or clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. This also goes in with verse 8, talking again about that Passover sacrifice. Think for the line above that I missed. Right. For Christ, as our Passover lamb also was sacrificed, tying it all back to the Passover itself. Concludes here in verse 8 in this section. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, the Passover feast, not with old leaven, nor with the, the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's making a clear allusion here uh, between leaven and sin. We need to clean our heart. We need to go through every corner of our heart and of our mind and find the things that, that violate God's standard, things that lead us back to self-worship. And we need to ask God to change our heart and mind about these things and to clean them out of who we are. Verse 9. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not at all mean that with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the greedy and the swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. Because he, he, he told him ahead of time, yeah, you need to stay away from the sexually immoral people. But I, I've seen Christians do this, and I've, I've thought it myself from time to time, how great it would be if we can all if, get all the Christians, all the real Christians together. We just all go in. We live on an island somewhere. Right? How amazing would that be? Because nobody would sin against each other. We'd all have each other's um, uh, desires before ourselves, and we would all together be glorifying God. Well, that will happen, but it'll happen in heaven. But that doesn't happen here. 
Paul makes the point that if, if you want to be away from everybody who sins in this world, you would have to leave the world. Verse 11, but now I am writing to you not to associate with any so-called brother or sister, a Christian, if he is a sexually immoral person or greedy or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Are you not to judge those who are within the church? But those who are from the outside, God will judge. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Again, heathen's going to heath. The, the unchristian person is going to act as an unchristian person acts. We can't control that. More than that, it's not my job to judge those people. God is their judge. But from us, from our life today, we judge those within the church. Just as we hope that the members of our church will continue to judge us. They're not doing it to be spiteful or mean or rude. They're doing it because they care for your soul. And they want you to judge them as well. All right. That is all the text and that is all the uh, notes as well for today. Um, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.